Join me as I explore a conquering force unlike anything the world has ever seen. Genghis Khan's Mongol Horde. In fewer than 70 years, they created the largest land empire ever in human history. How was Genghis Khan's army able to achieve military domination on such a grand scale? And what ultimately became the great empire of the Khans? To find out, I'll build a Gur in the Mongolian steppe, fire arrows from horseback like a Mongolian warrior, and use DNA science to trace the genetic legacy of a military genius, Genghis Khan. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Eight centuries ago, the Central Asian steppe witnessed the birth of an empire, one of the greatest the world has ever seen. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. I've come here to Mongolia to explore the history and legacy of the great Mongol horde and their infamous ruler, Genghis Khan. Located on the steppe of Central Asia, Mongolia is a small nation of two and a half million people. For most of the 20th century, Mongolia was a satellite state of the Soviet Empire, and the Soviets actively discouraged national pride in Genghis Khan. Today, Mongolia is an independent nation. Walking around the capital city, Ulaanbaatar, I can see the respect they have for him. The name and image of Genghis Khan is everywhere. On everything, from buildings, to beer bottles, to bills. They even put his face on the side of a mountain. For Westerners, the terror of Chinggis Khan's Mongol hordes is legendary. In the 13th century, they surged out of Mongolia and descended like locusts on the civilized world. They slaughtered indiscriminately, raped and pillaged. They were said to be primitive barbarians, illiterate, without art or agriculture heathens. At least, that's what many of us always heard. To explore the truth behind the legends, I've arranged to meet Mongol historian Dr. Chris Atwood on the face of Chinggis himself. Chris? Hey, Josh. Good to meet you. Yeah, Good you picked you. A, a great spot for a meeting. And we're standing in the face of, is it, is it Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan? I've heard both. It, it's Chinggis Khan. When, in the late 18th century, when French scholars began studying him through Persian manuscripts, they misread his name. They turned it from Chinggis Khan into Genghis Khan. And then later on, people began calling it Genghis Khan. Ah. But that's not right. No Genghis. Stick okay. with Chinggis. Okay, so who was Chinggis Khan? Well, he was a builder of the largest land empire in world history. There have been lots of empires over the past 800 years. There was nothing quite like the Mongol Empire. The Roman Empire at its height was one-fourth the size of the Mongol Empire at its height. The Empire of Alexander the Great was one half the size of the Mongol Empire at its height. I mean, this was in terms of scale off the map. And all of that was built within less than 70 years. The Mongolian Empire stretched from the Pacific Ocean to the Black Sea, including most of present-day Russia and China. A phenomenal 14 million square miles, the largest contiguous land empire ever. They overcame the most technologically advanced civilizations of their day, the Chinese, Persians, and Europeans. It's easy to see why modern Mongolians revere him. He's the person who founded their nation. He's the person who took them from being isolated, scattered tribes to being a nation, and moreover, a nation that was ruling Eurasia. Chinggis Khan is really more of a title than a name. It means universal leader. When he was born in 1162 AD, he was named Temujin. At that time, five tribes dominated the steppe, each with its own Khan. They existed in a state of perpetual anarchy. Unrelenting power struggles between Khans created a shifting landscape of tribal alliances and nearly constant violence. When Temushin was nine, his own father was poisoned by a rival tribe. Temushin thought all the nomads should be united under one Khan, 
and confront their enemies outside the steppelands. He was driven by an ancient tribal legend. Like the five tribes, there were five sons who fought bitterly among themselves. Their mother stopped them and said, each of you, take an arrow and break it. Then she said, now try to break these five arrows bound together. If you would be as a bundle of arrows, you'd be invincible. Temuching's dream was to unite the tribes and to then take advantage of the unique abilities of a unified nomadic people. What Chinggis Khan and his armies achieved was nothing short of amazing. What was so special about these ancient Mongols that allowed them to so comprehensively defeat their enemies? To find out, I've come to the National University of Mongolia to meet archaeologist Dr. Tuman Dashsebet. Dr. Tuman led an archaeological expedition that in 2004 made the amazing discovery of seven ancient graves marked by a single stone. Okay, you can open it. Go. Please come in. It is our storage room where we keep all archaeological findings. What's, in, what's inside? Inside is the skulls. Skulls? Yeah. She pulls out one of the boxes to show me. It's the skull of a woman. And Dr. Tuman says she has the rest of the skeleton already laid out in the next room. It's one of the rare skeletons that have been found in Mongolia in the Middle Ages. The nomads left most of their dead unburied for animals to devour. Only the elite were buried. Dr. Tuman tells me that this royal burial has already revealed valuable clues about life in the age of the Khans. Do we know when she lived? Yeah, she lived exactly at the Qing's period. Same Qing, time as Same, yeah. 11, 90 and 12, 30. So it's possible that she knew Genghis Khan? Maybe. Maybe. Right? Yeah, that's Maybe. exciting. There's some evidence to support this. Dr. Tuman shows me some of the treasures that were found buried with the woman, including gold-plated armor and a gold ring with the image of a falcon. Yeah, look, now there's a little falcon. Look at see, see that yeah. little bird in there. Yeah, the falcon was a symbol of the Genghis tribes. The falcon was the image of Genghis? Uh -huh, yeah. The ring may mean that this woman was related to Genghis, but in what way is a mystery. It's possible she was one of his wives. He was said to have had 36. But the falcon wasn't the only animal to accompany Mongol royalty into the afterlife. And you said there was something else buried with her? She was buried with this horse. A horse, her, horse skeleton? Yeah. Horse was underneath her? No, no, uh, the, the, on the... Next to her? Uh, next to her, and uh, same, on the same level. Same level, really? Yeah, the yeah. whole horse? Do you, have, do you have the horse? Here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this wow. is horse's head. Yeah, but not just the head, the whole skeleton. This, yeah. Buried with her? Yeah, not only just head. Mm -hmm. Was it common for these people to be buried with their horses? Yeah, with the horses. We uh, excavated the seven graves in this site. And in all seven graves, mm -hmm. there was a person and horse split. Every, every single human had a horse? Yeah. Because you'd think that they'd be buried with their most precious objects, you know? Yeah. So they're buried with gold, but to be buried with their horses? Yeah. They valued their horses that much. If ancient Mongolians buried horses alongside their royalty, then they clearly held this animal in high regard. I know they rode the horse into battle, but so did Napoleon, and he wasn't buried with a horse. What made the Mongolian horse so important to the empire of the Han? I'm on a quest to reveal the secrets behind the devastating power of Shingis Khan's Mongol hordes in the 13th century. I've learned that the Khan royalty were buried with their horses. By exploring this relationship further, I may be able to uncover how the Mongols were able to conquer half of Eurasia in only 70 years. So I'm leaving the capital city of Ulaanbaatar and heading out to the surrounding steppe. I want to get a closer look at the descendants of the horses that the people of the Khan's era valued so highly. <laughs> he said, turn off the road and look for the guy with the horses. That'll be me.
Enki Shagdar Guntev is a Mongolian interpreter and guide. He's offered to show me the countryside from the Mongolian perspective wow. on horseback. Enki! Hey, Josh! How are you? Good, how are you doing? So welcome to Mongolia. Yeah, thank Good you. to see you. You weren't kidding, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're really out here, huh? It's a good place to be a horse. Oh yeah. Hey, hey guys, how are you? They're smaller than I was expecting, right? Yeah, they're tough though, you know. Uh, you know, European horses are around like 16 hands, but you know, here, these right horses here, are, right? Yeah, these horses are like 12 to 13 hands. But beefy looking, stockier looking, you know? Oh, they're yeah. very robust. Yeah, they're Pretty in the wild, you know, they're just grazing the wild, you know, eat grasses. Grasses? And, yeah. So and they don't need any supplemental grain? No, not at all. Just grass? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Can we go for a ride? Oh yeah, let's go to my friend's uh, family and it's a nomadic family and you know, we can visit. Right. Enki tells me that in Mongolia, horses outnumber people 13 to 1. I've always wanted to ride one since I've heard they can be a challenge to handle. Most of the time, they run free in the wide open steppe, and the nomads round them up when they need them. This lifestyle right. makes them right. a bit unruly. So far so good. They prove true uh, to their reputation uh, when Enki's horse gets a little too close to mine. Hey. <laughs> horse, horse. Uh. Uh. That was that was something, huh? Gee, okay, so uh, I don't really know what happened. I don't know if I was thrown off or just twisted off, but the horse it, it seemed to be uh, it clearly wasn't happy. And but you know what they say when you get thrown off the horse, get back on, so let's all right, okay. so let's go, my friend. Yeah, round two. Let's try this again. Well, I think I have more respect now for Mongolian horses and the nomads who ride them. I'm looking forward to meeting Enki's nomadic friends, who he says are only a short distance away. They could be miles away, and I'd happily ride there, even on a temperamental horse. The landscape is like nothing I've ever seen a plain of grass and rivers stretching out to the gently rolling hills on the horizon. It's endless, and Mongolians take full advantage of it. So all of this, this step, you can put it, you can put it wherever you want. Half the population of Mongolia, over a million people, still live the way Chinggis did, in traditional gurs, what many people in America call yurts. Enki's friends are just ahead, dressed in ceremonial clothes to greet us as their guests. Enki introduces me to Agungjigjid and Nirgui. They've been living in this spot for about a month and will stay here until it starts to get cold. After welcoming me to their home, they show me how their girls are built. So they're setting up a gear for you. Very nice. No shelter balances so grace, you know, beauty, comfort, and mobility like a gur. The two posts in the middle aren't a structural necessity, but are of symbolic importance. A kind of highway for the spirits, connecting the center hearth to the heavens. <laughs> this becomes what you see inside. Well, basically their wallpaper. Then comes the insulation. Wool from their sheep has been felted, combed, soaked, and pressed into sheets like batting. It's almost perfect. Okay. If we were to do this the way Chinggis did it, yes. Is there any difference? Oh, you know, like uh, during that time, maybe they didn't have any white cover, like uh, felt as felt. Sure. There was almost no change since uh, Chinggis Khan time. Wow, it's looking nice. Oh yeah. yeah. Traditionally, the inside of a gur was fairly dark, with a single hole in the dome for light. They were also filled with smoke from their fires, burning the primary fuel source on the barren steppe, animal dung. The gurs of today's nomads are structurally the same, but have a few aesthetic improvements. This is beautiful. People sleep in here too? Yeah, this is mainly like, like father, mother, and the kids, they sleep here. Yeah, oh, so they, they have electricity. Yeah, they have a power the solar resource, cells. Yeah, solar cells, yeah. Uh. Mongolian custom dictates that guests are offered food drink. and drink. Yes, yeah. it is. It's like a beer for us. So that's the uh, mare's milk. Mare's milk? Yes. Pulled from a horse? Yeah. Horse mare, yeah. yeah, the first time. How do you like it? It's tangy. It's like tangy fermented milk. It's good. 
Let milk go almost spoiled and add a splash of light beer. That's what it tasted like. Yeah, maybe. Wow. After drink and food, there's another custom. Snuff. Yeah, that's, that's the snuff bottle. Snuff? Yeah. Just yeah, snuff it. Snuff it? Yeah, snuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Good morning. <laughs> Outside, we watch the kids round up some of their horses. These guys are good riders. Oh, yeah, they are. Even their five-year-old can handle a horse with ease. And this is how they, everyone grows up out here? Yeah. You know, On horseback, just riding the yeah, range? Yeah, they ride horses even before they start walking. Really? Yeah. Enki tells me that their skill as horsemen was one of the things Chinggis Khan was able to use to build an empire. But there were obstacles to overcome. Mainly the incessant raiding and fighting between the tribes. When he was still simply Temujing, he discovered a way of breaking this cycle and uniting the nomads. He rejected the supremacy of the tribe, with family groups each loyal to their own local clan. Temujin promoted those most brave in battle, rather than his own relatives. When he defeated a tribe, he would spare the lower members. He'd invite them to join his tribe as equals. One story relates how he congratulated an enemy soldier for wounding his cheek and gave him a position of honor. In this way, Temuching destroyed old bonds and rivalries at their core. He went out of his way to utterly destroy any family that opposed him. A favorite way of executing leaders was said to have been breaking their spine across a spear. By 1206 AD, he stood unchallenged on the steppe and was publicly proclaimed Genghis Khan, ruler of all the nomads. The five tribes were then called by the tribal name of the Khan, Mongol. With the tribes united, a major power was created. His territory was already the size of Western Europe. But he didn't stop there. Bringing together so many men under one banner gave the steppe dwellers a chance to look out to the rich civilizations beyond their borders. For most of my travels, I've had to look under the earth to discover the past. But here in Mongolia, it's right on the surface. The Mongolian nomads are living history. The family cooks a traditional meal, meat boiled in a hide with hot rocks. The nomads eat mostly meat and dairy, relying on their animals, not agriculture, to feed themselves. At the time of Shingas Khan, this reliance on animal protein set them apart from their neighbors. The agrarian civilizations surrounding the Mongols supported huge populations with their efficient grain production, vastly outnumbering the nomads. The Mongols numbered only around two million people. How could their small army conquer the territory of 100 million? Yeah, thank, thank you. Okay. I'd like to stay you. longer, but now that I've had a glimpse of Shingas okay. Khan's right, roots, I want to find out his next step. I've seen up close how much the Mongols on the steppe today still live like the nomads did at the time of the Khans. People sleep in gurs and depend on the horse for transport and food. Temujin, later called Shingis Khan, somehow tapped into the strengths of the nomadic people and their lifestyle. I've come to the National Museum of Mongolian History to find out what turned these nomadic hunters into world-conquering warriors. Renowned Mongolian archaeologist Dr. Bira Shagdar is here to help me find the answers. This is Genghis Khan, the founding father of the Mongolian statehood, mm -hmm. with his two banners. Uh, the white one is for peace, mm -hmm. the black one for war. Dr. Bira tells me that in the Mongols' shamanistic religion, the banners carried the warrior's destiny and his soul when he died. 
they worshipped the god of the sky, and Chinggis Khan believed that the sky god told him he should rule the world. He thought that it was heaven's order that he should become a great leader. So it sounds like his vision for yeah. empire yeah. was much broader yeah, but, than the other than the typical Khan's vision. Yeah, and his philosophy was there should be one Khan, as there is a one uh, one sun in the heaven. His philosophy was okay. there should be one Khan. Him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, he himself, of course. Genghis Khan thought his destiny was ordained by God. He didn't care about class, status, or blood ties. If you followed his way, he rewarded you. If you stood in his way, he destroyed you. As soon as he unified the tribes, Genghis Khan forbade raiding within Mongolia. With his God-given charge to unite the world under his rule, Genghis had the motive for conquest. But his army of typically 30,000 men was small compared to that of any of his neighbors. The Chinese could call on vast numbers of men. The Mongols were often outnumbered more than two to one. So how could Genghis Khan defeat his enemies? In Ulaanbaatar, I meet up again with Dr. Chris Atwood, who says he can help answer my question. The first thing to understand is the Mongols' choice of weapon. We've come to meet Batmonk, who makes bows and arrows in the traditional way, a skill that's been maintained through the centuries. How many people in the country still know how to do this? I think three. Two in Ulaanbaatar and one in the countryside. This is traditional, he says. I mean, this goes back for generations. His father, his grandfather, they were all bow makers, just like him. The bows are a composite of three materials, horn, wood, and sinew. This gives it strength and flexibility. His bows are then covered with a veneer of birch bark. Batmonk says that at the time of Shingis Khan, most warriors made their own bows. That flexes a lot, huh? The way this... Look at this. Watch the... Look at how that horn... The shape makes this a recurve bow, with the tips curving away from the archer. It adds much more force to the draw than a simple C shape, like a longbow. So it makes it so strong. Okay, I want to give this thing a shot. At a range just outside the city, archery lives on as a popular sport. Chinggis Khan was famous for promoting people on merit. I wonder if I can make the grade as a Mongol warrior. Historian Peter Marsh is going to help me check out the artillery of the Great Mongol Horde. But first, I want to practice shooting this bow without a horse, just to get a feel for it. So Josh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Gamba Tugwe, one of Mongolia's leading archers. Gamba, yeah, he's, 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 Gamba was very interested in my bow, and asked if he could try it out. I didn't get the joke then, but I was about to find out. He gives me a piece of horn to protect my thumb, and a quick lesson on archery, Mongolian style. Like this. Mm -hmm. and then you can pull. Well, that's different. So it's not, we're not pulling with these fingers here. Right, exactly. You're pulling with the pulling thumb, with thumb, which is protected with this little device here. Ah, right, we'll see. We'll give it a shot. Okay. Ah, wow. Ah. I'm a competent archer, oh, wow. but between the thumb ring and the bow's strength, it's a real ah, challenge. Right. <laughs> Much stronger bow than the archer. <laughs> the draw weight of this bow is 100 pounds. Ah, that hurts so much. Which hurts if it snaps against your fingers. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Better. I'm getting a little suspicious of how Gamba does it. Oh, oh. I'm gonna shoot with this bow, okay? I'm gonna work with this bow. Let me get the arrows. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. Make me start. Start on the 100 pound powerful bow. And he's shooting. Much lighter, but I think these Mongolians are having a good laugh at my expense. 
falling off horses using 100 pound bows. I'll try this with Gambas bow. It's okay, yeah? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Oh, but this is like uh, a world of difference here. Much nicer. Mongolian warriors were able to fire up to 350 yards. 100 yards farther than the longbow or crossbow of most of their enemies. So they had to get all this plus keep their horses under control. Mm -hmm. I know from past experience that putting the two together is a real challenge. It's time to see if I have what it takes to be a Mongol warrior. It's not easy. But in skilled hands, it was a deadly combination. The warriors could stand in their stirrups at full gallop and shoot in any direction. The two pieces, horse and bow, are a perfect fit, but don't fully account for the Mongols' success. Asian cultures had been shooting recurve bows from horseback for at least a thousand years. What they lacked was the military genius of Shingas Khan. He took the twin strengths of the nomads, great archery and great horsemanship, and added a new element, organization. Genghis Khan invented a new and efficient hierarchy for his army. Warriors were grouped in units of 10, then 100, then 1,000, then 10,000. The entire army was on horseback, unique in the ancient world. And each rider had at least two or three horses. This gave them unprecedented mobility on and off the battlefield. They could move 70 miles a day. Other armies struggled to move 10. Genghis Khan knew how to use the advantages of the horse. Their neighbors may have called them primitive barbarians, but on the battlefield, Genghis Khan and his Mongol horde were centuries ahead of their time. And the proof was written in the blood of their neighbors. The first to fall was the Chinese Empire of the Qin to the south. In seasonal campaigns beginning in 1206 AD, the Mongols conquered over 800,000 square miles. They raided the countryside and demanded surrender of the cities. Then in 1221, the assault against the Persian Empire began, which some say may have killed six million people. A favorite Mongol tactic was the feigned retreat, drawing the defenders to chase them, sometimes for days. Then turning on them. They never lost a battle. If a city resisted his army, he would utterly destroy it and all who lived there. They earned the reputation barbarian. His sons followed in his murderous footsteps, eventually extending the empire from the Pacific in the east to the Black Sea in the west and putting more than 100 million people under Mongol control. It's hard to imagine looking at Mongolia today. So if this was the largest land empire in the world, you have to wonder, where is it? What's left of it? To find out, I've left Ulaanbaatar and I'm heading to Mongolia's first capital, the city of Kharkhorum. I'm here in Mongolia to learn how the 13th century Mongol hordes created a land empire that was the largest the world has ever known. I've discovered that part of the secret behind the Mongols' military success was their brilliant horsemanship, combined with the power of the recurve bow and the organizational genius of their leader, Genghis Khan. Now I'm heading toward Kharkhorum, the capital of the empire, to see how the so-called barbarians governed 100 million people. Today, the city is an archaeological site 230 miles southwest of Ulaanbaatar. Many people say the Mongols never intended to create an empire. They just wanted to live their nomadic lifestyle and raid and pillage the cities of sedentary people. But they were so successful in destroying their opponents 
that eventually they were forced to build a city of their own. I meet up again with Dr. Chris Atwood by the walls of a 16th century monastery that was built where Karakorum once stood. But, you know, it was built with stones from the antithetic Karakorum. So, so the real site? It's over there. So gonna, yeah? Right over can we, there. Can we go look at it? Yeah, sure, let's take a look. Right here, these are the best preserved remains of the real old Karakorum of the 13th century. So these are where some of the capital buildings were? Yeah. These big pillars here, these were bases for buildings. Mm -hmm. But there are still discoveries yet to be made about this capital. Lots of discoveries. Look here. This is probably from one of the tiles on the roof of this palace or temple or whatever it was that was here. During the Khans? During the time of the Khans. You're really? holding a piece of 13th century green glazed ceramic. This too? Yeah, that too. And they're everywhere. Yeah, must have had an amazing roof. I think I'll leave it here. Yeah. Okay. Pillar stumps and roof tiles are all that's left on the surface today. But in the 13th century, a Flemish missionary named William of Rubruck wrote about his travels to Central Asia on a failed attempt to convert the Mongols. He described Karkorum in detail. It was built primarily by Shingas Khan's son, Ogade Khan. It was small, covering an area of only a couple square miles, and surrounded by a suburb of Gurs. There were four markets, one at each city gate. It was home to about 10,000 people. There were 12 houses of worship, all different religions, a kind of religious diversity that was unparalleled in the medieval world. The palace of Ogade was the gem of the city with intricate relief work and a roof of green and red tiles. Why would these nomadic, basically herdsmen, why would they need a palace structure at all? Well, this was a city for storing all the riches that the Mongols had accumulated, but it wasn't so much material riches. The Mongol Khans, when they got material riches, they just gave them away. The main riches were the artisans and the experts, all the people from the various countries that they brought into their entourage. Many of them were Chinese, they were Persian, there was Europeans, Russians, all kinds of people in the empire that were working for the Mongol princes. But they couldn't live on the steppe. They just weren't adapted to that. Chinggis himself, when he visited the city, would live outside the walls in Agur. As his empire grew, he proved to be more than just a brilliant warrior. He was an innovative administrator and statesman. And what Chinggis Khan did was he joined east to west, took these various civilizations of the Middle East and forced them to learn from each other. And there's this free exchange of ideas and techniques and the Chinese are talking to the Persians and the Persians are talking to the Europeans. Right. You know Copernicus? The star charts he worked from were star charts made under the patronage of the Mongols because the Mongols they didn't want to hear about how Middle Eastern astronomy was the best or Chinese astronomy was the best. What they wanted was the best of everything. So they told the Chinese and the Middle Eastern astronomers, get together, make the best charts you can. So this was, in many ways, a melting pot of all the cultures across the empire. Exactly. It was a melting pot in the middle of the steppe. Chinggis Khan created his empire through death and destruction, then went on to radically alter world culture. He brought about the first contact between Europe and China, and encouraged a dramatic increase in trade throughout the empire. He guaranteed the safety of camel trains. He invented the first Pony Express. He pioneered the idea of diplomatic immunity, and he outlawed torture. Some barbarian, huh? So what happened to Shingis Khan? Chris tells me that when he died, he was buried secretly in an unmarked location. Some Mongolian chronicles tell the stories that they just say he died, they don't say anything about where he's buried. But there are travelers' tales that say Chinggis Khan was buried and those who buried him were killed. And then those who killed them were also killed. They would trample horses over the spot so that it would look like as if nothing had been there in order to keep it absolutely secret. As for Kharkhorum, it existed for only about 50 years. After Chinggis Khan's death in 1227 AD, the empire began to fracture into smaller Khanates. In 1274, his grandson, Kublai Khan, moved the capital south to China and created the city of Beijing. 
Karhorum, the city in the steppe, had no function and wasted away. They say that history is written by the winners, but in this case, history was written by the victims. To the Persians, the Chinese, and the Europeans, the hordes were demonic murderers. And that's how they're often remembered today. But not in Mongolia. Exactly 800 years after Chinggis Khan unified the steppe tribes, the Mongols' brief stint as empire is a source of pride. I've discovered that the so-called barbarians of 13th century Mongolia, though brutal in warfare, ruled their empire with a surprisingly tolerant bent. 800 years later, Mongolia is a quiet country. But the impact that Chinggis Khan had on all of Eurasia is incalculable. It's not surprising Mongolians are proud of their history. And nowhere is that more evident than here in the capital, where everyone has come together to celebrate and acknowledge the 800th anniversary of the Mongolian state, founded by Chinggis Khan. This is the annual Natam Festival, where every year Mongolians display two of the skills that brought them glory. Master horsemanship and archery. Their conquest led to a complete change of life for the Mongol people. Almost overnight, they went from being backward nomads, mocked and ridiculed by their more civilized neighbors, to being masters of their universe. Chinggis Khan put Mongolia on the map. And today, Mongolians revere him as a visionary founding father. The spirit of Chinggis Khan is alive and well in the hearts of Mongols today, but genetic scientists are now discovering that his legacy may also be found in their blood. I have come to the Mongolian Academy of Sciences to meet some genetic researchers who are tracking down the genes of Chinggis Khan. Dr. Dashniam Bumbang's team sampled the DNA of three million Asian so this men. Is where it all happens. You, you took a sample from across, from, from across Asia. Yes. We study only Y chromosome. Y chromosome. So, which is, uh, let's say, sign of men, right? Okay, so you, all the samples were men? Men. And I know that the Y chromosome does not change, right? From yes, father yes, to son? Yes. Typically. Uh, y chromosome, they transfer from father to son mm -hmm. directly mm -hmm. without any change. The Y chromosome determines a person's sex. Where women have two X chromosomes, men have an X and a Y chromosome. Since a son has exactly the same Y chromosome as his father, geneticists can isolate this chromosome and track it across generations of male relatives. And that's basically all it takes to get a Y chromosome sample. That little swab is then put into a vial, and that vial is sent off to the lab, where they remove the DNA from the cotton and create a Y chromosome sequence. From this data, Dr. Dushniam discovered that in Mongolia, one branch of the family tree is huge. The same Y chromosome turned up again and again. He's calculated that it's the Y chromosome of a man who lived sometime in the 13th century. Somebody was very busy, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> Had a lot of kids. Yes. Our genetic data and calculations showed that was Genghis Khan. But how do you know that this is Chinggis' DNA? We don't know. We don't have a body. Uh, yes. It could be someone else living at the same time. How do you know that? This is uh, two things. One is genetic study, and second is historical data. We can read in the historical books in very detail who was Chinggis Khan, how many sons and grandsons, wives he has. So this historical data really confirm our genetic data. So as he's conquering the yes. empire, yes. he's sort of starting another one. Chinggis and his sons after him each had hundreds of concubines and had made it a mission to spread their seed throughout the lands they conquered. A combination of the massive death toll of the initial campaigns and this one family's breeding strategy appears to have borne fruit. And so now, 800 years later, the Natam Festival 
drawing visitors from all over Mongolia is more than a commemorative event. It's a huge family reunion. Looking around, how many of the people I see could be Chinggis Khan's relative? It makes me wonder. Some of our crew is from this part of the world. Could one of them be a descendant of the great leader? Everyone on the crew contributed some DNA to find out, including myself. Here are my results. Each of these pairs of numbers stands for a variation of a gene. In the first two pairs, Chinggis and I match. 16. But not for the rest. 13. Okay, okay yeah. No. And no. Too many differences across the pattern. I admit, it wasn't very likely. But here are the results for all the members of the crew, including our local fixers here, the people who help us handle the logistics in this country. So let's line them up. One of the fixers is a match. And the winner is... Baggy! Hey! Like, good. Yeah, come here, I'll show you. I'm happy. Almost every single number is a match. Bagi, Thank you. Baggy Khan. Yeah. Baggy Khan. Khan. <laughs> it just goes to show that Chinggis Khan's progeny are everywhere in this country. Something Mongolians point to with pride. A lot of people can share Baggy's royal ancestry. Dr. Dushtiam has calculated that across the lands they conquered, 8% of the population is descended from Shingis Khan. Worldwide, that's about 1 in 200 people. The estimated size of his current family is over 32 million. That makes him the most successful patriarch in recorded history. He was a military genius unlike any the world has ever known. And his blood continues to flow through millions of people. His empire is ancient history. But the legacy of Chinggis Khan lives on in the genetic fabric of our world. <laughs>